Hello, I'm your host, Paula Farmer from Book Passage. Welcome to another very special edition of Conversations with Authors, brought to you today by Book Passage and in partnership with Rake Straw Books. Yay for indie bookstores. Uh, thank you for being a cherished part of our audience and supporting these stores and these events and supporting fantastic authors like we have today. Um, who cares about football and basketball when we have thought-provoking live programming like this um, with award-winning authors? Please, please turn off that football and join us. Um, and please keep in mind, if you'd like to use the closed caption, you, we do have that available. You just tap that little button as well as tap our YouTube like and subscribe. Doesn't take much for you to do that, but it really helps out Book Passage a lot. Um, so feel free to subscribe and you'll get a lot of wonderful events like today. Uh, today's featured book, uh, very recently released, um, I believe just a few days ago, Small World by Jonathan Evison. It's an epic novel set against such iconic backdrops as the California Gold Rush, the development of the Transcontinental Railroad, and a speeding train of modern day strangers forced together by fate. It is a grand entertainment that asks the big questions. Uh, Jonathan's previous novels, I'm sure most of you joining us are familiar, uh, all about Lulu, West of Here, the revised fundamentals of caregiving, This Is Your Life, Harriet Chance, Lomboy, and many others. He joins us from Washington State. Um, and Jonathan doesn't mess around when it comes to getting uh, his in-conversation partners uh, because his today is none other than Jason Mott, uh, whose 2021 novel, Hell of a Book, won the National Book Award uh, for fiction. He has also published three previous novels. His first, The Returned, was a New York Times bestseller and was turned into a TV series. He joins us from North Carolina. Thank you to Jonathan and Jason, and I'm gonna let you take it away, Jason. All right, Thank cool. You. Thank you very much, Paula. And hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Jason Mott, and I'm here hanging out with Jonathan Everson, which I am very, very excited about. Um, I definitely want to also thank Book Passage again for having us both here today. Remember, support your local bookstores. Like, that's the best place to put your money. Um, yeah, so we're going to have have an author to author talk. Jonathan, how's it going, man? Good, man. You're amazing to do this, dude. You are so busy right now since the NBA, particularly you're busy anyway. But like, I know how crazy things can get uh, when, you know, uh, things blow up. Not like they have for you, but like, I mean, I just it means so much to me that you do this for me. I really appreciate it. No, I'm glad to do it. Um, I definitely want to talk about that green screen, though. That is the coolest green screen I've seen in quite some time. Combined with the hat. Like you got some cool stuff going on, man. <laughs> well, I yeah, the $2 no novelty hat never fails. I used to do like the uh, blue fedora, blue suit. And then right. and, and for like 15 years, I did that. <clears throat> and then the pandemic hit and I just got fat. And I thought, God, I put my old monkey suit on and I just looked like I ate the old guy that wore it. So I sort of <laughs> went ahead and, uh, oh, see, I'm just getting shy about it. I'm getting all red because uh, I'm going with the Alan Hale Jr. look now, the skipper. <laughs> I think it's working got, for you. Uh, got the physique to match. And... <laughs> it's looking awesome. Um, so, yeah, so we're here to talk about uh, Small World, which I am just very, very thrilled to be talking about. Like, it is rare. I'm, I'm a harsh critic. Like, I am the first one to admit that. Like, when it comes to reading novels, like, I don't read as much fiction as people probably think I do as an author. Um, and it's because of the fact that like, I am such a harsh critic when it comes to reading. Like, the fiction that I read has to be doing just top shelf, amazing things for me to actually just finish it. And I am very proud to say that small world just like put me on my butt so many times. And it's just, it's just an amazing book, man. Amazing. Oh man. Thanks. I mean, I don't know. What, I don't know what to say to that. I'm the same way about being a harsh critic. And I think that's helpful as a writer because yes. I'm sure obviously, and it shows in your work, you're your own harshest critic. Uh, I, you got to be hard on yourself. And unfortunately those that are hard on themselves tend to be hard on the work of others at times, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think that's true. Um, so cool. So like, I want to talk a little bit about like your background, like your writing. Um, you know, I, I, obviously, we're going to talk about the book and talk about the characters and the plot, all those basic interview questions that you've answered two dozen times already by now, I'm sure. Um, but I love talking writer to writer because there's always I've noticed like 
there are always people in the audience who are like aspiring writers and who just want to know about the craft and the trade and how things come to happen. Um, so first, like this is your seventh novel, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, well, seventh published novel. There's sure. there's nine failures. Uh, <laughs> seven of them before I had one published, and then I've had a couple failures since too. But books that just were the center didn't hold. I finished them in some cases five or six times, but the center still didn't hold. So I just wiped them off the face of the earth. So I'm still batting less than 500, but uh, I hope to catch that eventually. And I, I have another one finished. So actually, that would put me. I'm only one more, and I'll be at 500. <laughs> No, that's terrific. That's terrific. And I'm glad I'm really glad you said that, because like I think people had this mystique about writers. They were like, you know, you all your first novel is your quote unquote, your first manuscript. He, people think that you just kind of you're, you're you sit down to the page the very first time and a novel comes out and it gets published and cool things happen. And they don't hear about the seven that you had before that, where you were still learning your craft and learning how to make it happen. Yeah, no, I literally dug a hole buried the first manuscript and salted the earth so nothing would ever grow there again which is way more uh yeah it's probably more hoopla than it deserved um but there was things in it the promise i mean you know the thing is that with me it's like i gotta do it i, I gotta the work i live for the work i mean it's great to be published i love having readers uh, you know i love selling books i love supporting my family but like i didn't write seven books because I thought number eight was the charm. I did it because I have to, you know, I mean, like I got a tiger by the tail. So if I, if I didn't have the work, I swear to God, I would definitely be like an IV drug user or else out, you know, shouting at a parking meter somewhere. I mean, I would literally lose it after two weeks of not writing. My wife's like, you got to go to the cabin, man. I mean, you're getting, <laughs> I'm hard to live with, you know, I just, I just, I'm just so compelled to do the work, you know, maybe it's because I, I'm full of self-loathing and I just want to get out of my own way and get into like the escapism of writing fiction. But like, now they're going to have to pry the pen out of my hand as long as I'm still challenging myself. You know, I, I just, I got to do it. I just got to do it. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I have a very similar mindset and I absolutely love seeing it in other people. And that's terrific. Um, so let's talk about small world. Like it is, it, you know, I use this term very, very uh, rarely, but it is truly an epic novel. Like it is a cross generation American narrative. I think it's something that most writers would hesitate to even attempt, let alone be able to pull off. Um, and yet you do it. Like for those who don't know, um, Small World is a, it is truly a cross-generational novel. It covers, it's the story surrounding this train crash and the lives that are interacted, you know, in this train crash, but it also traces backwards to the kind of the lineage of the people who were, came before these people that are on this train and how they got to here. So in the space of these 400 some pages, you get multiple generations, multiple viewpoints, multiple races, races, multiple background. It is just doing so much, so fast and so well. Um, like, how, what made you want to write? Like, how did this book come to be? The traditional questions, like, how, you know, where did this book start? How did this one come to be? Something this big? You know, really, the, the, the first thing was just the conceit of the thing itself. Like, it was the eve of my 50th birthday, and I was out in the garage drinking beer, listening to music really loud, and I had to I had, I work with these like two by three paperboard sheets and I spread them out all over the pool table and the ping pong table that are all over. And I got like 40 different colors of Sharpies and I just kind of walk around the room. I don't even know what my, the method to the madness is yet, but I, I find myself reaching for different colored pens that are like correlative, correlative lines of thinking and stuff. And then, then I start to consolidate those and stuff. But as I'm sitting there above the blank ones, I had just finished a string of, you know, I'm not going to call them quiet novels, but they were more character studies. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of them were first person, talk to you like a friend type of novels. They weren't without their share of literary py pyrotechnics or subversion or whatever. They, But I really wanted to swing for the fences. I mean, it was something about turning 50. I'm like, so that was the first thing was like, I want to write something that I, I totally risk falling flat on my face and ruining mm -hmm. my career with because I wanted to play in a high stakes game because what else matters, you know? Yes. So. I first arrived at uh, the characters of Finn and Nora because, you know, I kind of took the, you know, <clears throat> but then I quickly discovered, look, if I'm going to tell America's story, we have this, uh, you know, we have this American mythos 200 years in the canon of this sort of idea that it's all about European immigrants coming here and building this country. And when in reality, the story of America is every bit as much, if not more about the people who came here against their will and the people who are here before us. And so what I wanted to do, I, wa I wanted to tackle immigration from East and West as well, but I wanted to, I wanted all of those elements who was here, who was forced to be here, who came here looking for opportunity and find a way 
uh, to speak to the present moment in America without writing a political polemic or being really too, you know, some finding a way to be hopeful with that and to tell America's story and to just sort of like, uh, you know, ask, you know, whether or not the American dream is made true on its promises. And so mm. the only way I could think to speak to the modern moment without it being a, you know, we've taken what was the greatest, I think, uh, strength of this country, diversity, and, and we reduced it to tribalism. I wanted to put us all back in that same boat and tell a big widescreen tale that uh, would would force the reader to sort of recognize that they're in this together as, as, as divisive as we become and, and everything. The only thing I could think of to speak to the common moment was a train speeding out of control. Uh, and now it occurs to me that it should have probably been speeding south instead of north, but <laughs> missed opportunity there. There you go. <laughs> No, that's terrific because I, that actually, you know, I love how like that answers one of my questions I had earlier. Like one of my questions I was going to ask you is like, why does this novel exist? And you you did a wonderful job just now answering it because I believe every novel for a writer there's a there's a reason beyond like there's you know there's a pragmatic reason oh, I want to swing for the fences, but then there's also like this underlying driving current of like this thing that you want to say and you want to talk about and like that you're really impassioned about. And I love that your your comment about how like the state of america and like trying to remind us of all of like where we you know where america kind of came from in all scopes i think that's really brave really interesting um were there any points of of nerve like obviously you you're, you 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 know playing in a high state game is pretty nerve-wracking for most people like how did you feel like getting through that like were you terrible were you worried about things at the time were you kind of scared of things or are you at the point now where it's like ah just just go for it I'll be honest with you, and I don't want this to sound like hubris, but I want the ball with two seconds left. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm that guy that wants the ball with two seconds left. I believe I'm going to make the shot. And, and I don't have I have plenty of self-loathing and plenty of self-doubt, but I don't let it I don't let it. You know, you, it's like working a chainsaw. You know what I mean? You don't want to be doubting yourself while you're doing it. So I was pretty confident once I decided screw it. I mean, once I just admitted, look, the stakes are high. If I screw this up, I could ruin a career I've worked, you know, 15 years to build. But uh, I was really pretty confident it went on. I mean, and I think it's because I trust the process. You know what I mean? I know I might write myself into 100 corners. I may know. I, I mean, I've gotten 50, 60,000 words into a draft and just like literally dragged it into the garbage and started from scratch and undaunted because I know that work isn't wasted. I mean, I know I was just seeding the earth or whatever, so that it'll be better this time. So as long as you trust the process. I feel like you never get lost that way. Like, I mean, yeah, there were six characters I cut out of this thing. And, you know, I wrote myself down some blind alleys, but I really deep down, I just knew if I just trust the process and I just keep, you know, if I just keep grinding and keep my eyes, keep my eyes on the prize and stick to stick to trying to bring the book I envisioned to life that, I mean, I'd get there eventually. And I got there quicker than I ever expected, to be honest, just because I gave myself to the thing. You know what I mean? Mm hmm. Do you ever had that experience as a younger writer where you felt like you were there and like the whole canon of Western literature is on your back and like, here you are, what do I have to say? You know, how am I going to edify the reader? <laughs> you know what I mean? When I was younger, it was more like that. Now it's like, I've realized that like, it's all about the reader. It's this dance we're doing and they're doing everything yeah. I'm doing backwards and heels. And like my job, really, I'm best at my job when I just get the hell out of my own way. You know what I mean? Yes, uh, definitely what you mean. Way like write the book as you want to experience as a reader, you know? So mm -hmm. I know I like convergences. I know I like uh, multi, you know, uh, you know, many points of view and I like bifurcated timelines. And so, I mean, I write the book the way I would want to read it. That's terrific. That's terrific. Yeah. And I think, I think you're right. I think when I was a younger writer, you know, the, all the, the greats, you know, there's these shadows kind of loom over you as an author. And I think that that chokes you on the page a lot of the time. You're so worried about what would so-and-so think of this thing that I'm writing as opposed to what do I think of this thing I'm writing and like what experience do I want to create on the page? Um, but that's the thing, that's the thing that takes some time to learn. So it's cool. Like it shows in your writing, like it shows in this story. Um, and I also want to say like, as we just quick pause here, like for anyone, if you have questions, please put your questions in the comments page on YouTube and the questions will get here either for Jonathan or for myself or whomever, just please ask questions. We will save time at the end for Q and A. So please put some questions in there. Um, yeah, by all means, ask Jason questions too, because I, I mean, I know I'm the one supporting a book right now, but this guy just won the NBA, and so you got a great chance to. He's a great resource, so like, yeah, absolutely ask him. Well, questions. thank you, thank you. But I'm, I'm definitely, I'm loving talking about your book though. Like, I, again, like it is, it is such a the fact that you were able to weave all these characters together and to give them such realism and such relatability. I thought that was very powerful because um, it is not, it is not easy. You've got a, you know, characters with Irish background. You've got 
um, a Chinese family, you have an African American family, you have a Native American family, like all these these different lineages over these different times in these different locations. Like there is a massive amount of courage, I think, to write those kinds of characters and to commit to doing them and making them whole, realized, complete people, which you completely did. Um, I'd be curious about like, your, was there any kind of trepidation of that on that at any point in time? Like, how did you feel approaching that particular challenge of like this level of authentic diversity that you actually managed to pull off really well? Like, I would love to hear more about that. Well, first, it helps that it's historical because I've got to kind of write set at, you know, at some point you're going to have to write outside the purview of your, uh, you know, personal experience. But um, mm-hmm. I probably should have a little more trepidation. You know what I mean? In the age we live in, like, who's this fat middle aged white guy to be writing about all this diversity when it's beyond, you know, when he is in that. And, and what I would say is that luckily I'm blessed with a very diverse group of friends and resources, people to bet the work. You know what I mean? Like, like whenever I write outside my personal experience uh, in any way, gender, race, job, anything, it's always, you know, the onus is on me to get it right. I've, I've always felt like everybody should be able to write whatever they want. But, you know, the court of a public opinion is a court of a public opinion and the onus is on me to get it right. So if I hit false notes, I'm going to wind up in trouble. I try not to do that. And I try to I, I try to, you know, utilize the the the. The resources at my, you know, like, for instance, in the last book, I had an Iraq uh, combat veteran and I'm not an Iraq co- combat veteran. I, you want to be very careful with that experience. You know what I mean? Luckily, I have three friends that serve. And one of them in particular, my friend Paul, was so helpful because like I gave him early drafts of this stuff and he was awesome. He was brutal, really funny, but brutal. He's like, this sounds like a fucking Navy federal commercial. Like that. What the, what the fuck is you? I mean, this is what I ask of my beta readers not to pull their punches. You know, the longer you write, the more, the more you realize how important this input is, you know, when you're young, you're like, Oh, like, well, well, I did that because, well, actually you just don't understand because, you know, now I'm just like, just beat me, flagellate me. <laughs> because I got to get this right. I don't want to hit a single false note. You know what I mean? I don't want to, when I write a 79 year old woman character, I don't need all my mom's friends bugging me in the safe way going, wow, what do you know about a 70, you know, but they didn't, they, they all said, how did you do that? You know what I mean? And I said, just by getting out of my own way, mostly using my eyes, my ears, talking to people, you know, my mom was a 79 year old woman. I've observed her my whole life. So that helped. But I mean, I think the thing is, is when you peel back the layers of gender and race and all and experience in general, I'm really trying to get at the universal. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. All of the other stuff is super important and plays into the character's dynamic. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I'm looking for that universal human experience. So the last thing I want to do is get in my own way by hitting false notes that are, uh, you know, on the surface or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's wonderful. I think, I, yeah. And as you know, as everyone has already told you, like you definitely nailed it. Like the book does it in such a powerful way. Um, again, cause I, I'm always, I'm always reading so, so, so acutely, particularly when people are writing, you know, black characters, like I'm, I'm really fascinated to see how those characters get written. Cause I do believe, like you said, like everyone should write, you should write characters outside of who you are. That's the purpose of writing in my opinion, um, to kind of create that empathy. And I think you did a really phenomenal job with it. So it's just, it's really cool. Um, so I'd love to hear about, I'm going to kind of, kind of slowly turn to like a writing philosophy discussion for just a little bit. Yeah. Um, you, what's your, what, what is your feeling on like the purpose of writing? Like why do you know, not so much why do you write, but like, why do you write? What is your purpose for writing? Like what makes you come to the page to create these stories and to build them, to work, you know, spend your entire life just grinding against this stone wheel of writing that it is? Honestly, because I think it is the greatest empathic window of fiction that humanity has ever created. I mean, I'm a huge cinemaphile. I love music. I'm looking at your books. I go, you should see my record collection. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, I got a ton of books too, but like, but nothing invites you on such an intimate level to, to experience this otherness, to walk outside of your experience. And like, honestly, I do it to become a more expansive person to, to, to like a crew experience that feels lived through this, this wonderful vehicle, this gift of riding to just jump through that empathic window and, and you know what happens is you you probably had this experience too in your head. Sometimes stuff happens in your books. It feels like it really happened to you. And sometimes it gets mixed up. Like you thought you, you, you had this experience and you realize, no, you only wrote about that experience. It can be, um, I mean, I think it makes me a better, and I would say the same for reading too, but I mean, it makes me a better husband. It makes me a better friend. It makes me a better person. And so that's why I kept going. Like I said, that in my biomania. But every time I finish a book, I feel like a, I really feel like a more expansive person. I feel like I've learned. 
And beyond that, I just don't want to, I'm not here to edify anybody. I feel like my job description would be to just get down there. And, and, and to me, it tends to be with working class people because that's where I come from. Uh, I usually write about marginalized people because uh, that's who I'm most interested in. But I'm just trying to start the dialogue. I'm not trying to edify anybody or, well, maybe subtly I'm trying to foist my worldview on them a little bit. But mostly I feel like it's my job or our job to just ask the questions and start the conversation, mm -hmm. which is why I'm never bummed out by bad reviews. People don't believe me, but it's like, look, man, I'd rather have the lead review in the New York Times than be eviscerated than be buried on page six with a glowing review because no one's going to, what's important is the conversation. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Talking yeah. about the book, I've done my job. They can all hate it. Look, I mean, I've just been dealing with two months of book banning on a book I'm really proud of. And, and I don't take it personally. After the threats all stopped and things like that, I was like, it was a, it was a wonderful thing to happen to me because I got this outpouring of support from librarians and students and educators. And I'm like, you know what? If you get banned, you must be doing something right, you know? So. Yeah, banned books are the best books to read. That's a fact of life. <laughs> so that's terrific. <laughs> Um, so we got a couple of questions actually from from viewers. So let's kind of you know we'll just sidetrack to a few questions. So N.J. Travis asks, "I read it. I read the book in 24 hours. Hey, that's a great sign." Um, he said, "What was in the blue locket?" Uh, what was in the blue locket was uh, did wasn't it? It was engraved with the letter L. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't. Even, I'm, this is embarrassing. I've written two books since then. I'm trying to remember. I, can I say one thing about the blue locket? Sure. I added the blue locket in the final draft. You know, once I and, and I just reverse engineered it through the whole thing, because once I figured once I had my arcs, I uh, I just went through draft and draft looking for points of connectivity, looking for ways to because the biggest challenge is look at me, avoid this question, because I don't remember what I just remember the locket had an L on it. And so that was significant for without spoiling it. But uh, I think it's interesting you bring up the locket and I wonder if readers will realize that like I I, that's an after the fact thing that I wove through the whole story. And there's a bunch of elements like that. Cause like with a novel like this, what I found was the, the hardest thing I think is that with a big cast, I wanted, I didn't ever want to write a book that has a persona dramatist at the beginning or a key where the reader has to go, Oh, well, wait, who is this again? Is this somebody's grandpa? Or wait, I, mm -hmm. I just wanted the track characters to track fluidly. And so uh, just as a continuity issue, I mean, there's going to be every character besides the character of mine is going to be off the page for 70, 80 pages at a time as I cycle through them. So I had to develop this like uh, system of connectivity, just layers and layers of connectivity, sometimes genealogically, sometimes geographically, sometimes experientially, sometimes even coincidentally, which is one of the, you know, Dickensian elements of this novel, I think that speaks to the name small world because you know dickens operated in a small world there's so many so much coincidence in dickens you know what i mean and, and, a, and a wonderful kind of coincidence uh, boy that was a, a meandering question about the locket but <laughs> that's a great answer i don't remember you know. what was actually in the locket now that <laughs> maybe it was maybe the letter l was in the locket i don't remember no, that's, and that's, I'm, I'm coming to your defense here. Like, I don't, I don't people like, how do you not remember? Like, like you said, you've written two whole books since and then. And a screenplay and a feature screenplay. So and like, a screenplay, like the, the number of the, the hundreds of thousands of words circulating through your brain in the time since you finished that novel. Like, yeah, I, I, so it's okay to forget. It's totally okay. <laughs> yeah, I totally remember the significance of the blue lock. And I just, I think it was just a letter L inside, wasn't it? I mean. That's awesome. All right. Next question. Uh, Brock Doubles asks, why do you hate the Dave Matthews band so much? <laughs> Okay, I know Brock Doubles, and he, what he really wants to ask is why you dissing on Walnut Creek because that's where he lived. <laughs> um, I, you know, I just I, no offense. I, Dave Matthews is from all reports, a super nice guy. He lives in Seattle. Now. I'm actually surprised I haven't met him because I have so many friends in the music industry here. But uh, no, I just it's just not my sound that jammy college. And you know, part of it is probably not even Dave Matthews fan that like frat boys picked him up and. I just, just not my vibe. Like, okay. Okay, cool. No, that's totally, I feel terrible. I don't like that crap on another artist. And, and I, I don't in real life. That was fiction. I love Dave Matthews. My character <laughs> doesn't like Dave Matthews. Jenny Chen. Talk to Jenny Chen is my answer. Cause I like very him. fair, very fair. He's wonderful. He's wonderful. Um, it's funny. So, all right. So speaking of dissing other author, dissing other artists, I'm going to say like, I like to believe that every writer has a canonical giant that they absolutely hate. Someone that the canon loves and who gets all these literary acclaim for like whatever reason that you as an author just cannot load. You just loathe everything they've written or, you you know, so who is your uh, who's your who's your if you met him in a bar, he might might have some words with him. 
<laughs> I wouldn't take it as far as complete loathing because I admire the ambition. I admire sure, the sure, language. Sure. I admire the themes and, and, and I admire a lot of the work, but I have problems with Faulkner. Okay. Guess, yeah. Because I, 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 it's hard for me to, if, as long as I view Faulkner just through the lens of modernism and, and, you know, the experimental work he was doing and saying, you know, look, this is going on in the visual arts as well. This is going on. This is of the time. This is going on in architecture. It's one thing, but on the page narratively, I read Absalom, Absalom, and I'm just riveted to the themes and things like that. But like when he changes points of view four times in a sentence and it just feels like he's showing off, right? I just always feel like it's look at me, William Faulkner. I'm just too aware. I smell the coffee on his breath, you know, and there's chicory <laughs> in it. Uh, and I don't like chicory in my coffee. No, I, I, I just so, and, and like I say, there's a lot of Faulkner I really like, but that is a problematic one because I say that and they think they think I must be an idiot because the same people probably, a lot of them think Dickens is just sentimental and, and uh, you know what I mean? Like uh, Dickens, yeah. you know, the, the establishment even wouldn't even recognize him as anything but an entertainer until the 1970s. You know what I mean? He was like a pop artist, but like, to me, he's just such a wonderful storyteller whose language is way underrated, whose characters, while they sometimes stray towards the corniness with their quirk and, you know, butcher's name, Mr. Cutty Meat and things like that. Like at the end of the day, I think the guy has to be one of the most amazing writers that ever lived because he wrote all this stuff serialized. Here, mm -hmm. me and you talk about writing, and there's so much reverse engineering. And if he had a locket, man, he had to conceive that thing right away and pull it all the way through. Mm -hmm. You know, everything was serialized. And also, I think uh, he just changed the he just changed the focus of the novel. The Victorian novel was about the landed gentry until Dickens came along and started writing about child labor and things that mattered. So you see, I sort of swerved away from hating on Faulkner because I don't really hate <laughs> it. But it, just, it is hard for me. Modernism in general, it's just not what I'm after. I want to access the story, not so much intellectually, but with my whole body and my heart and my, you know, I want to live the narrative. And the more experimental it is, the less access I feel like I have it anyway, but intellectually, you know what I mean? Mm hmm. That's just totally subjective. So there it is, Faulkner. That's my bugaboo. Now, like ten people are going to drop off and say this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Exactly, I, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's the reason I put it out there. <laughs> How about you? Now you put me on the hot seat. Who's your? No, I have no problem. I I I have a huge issue with Raymond Carver. Um, Raymond Carver's writings, I have massive issues with. Like as far back as I can remember, like when I was first got into writing, um, one of my instructors had us write some, you know, read some short stories and write about them. And I read a Raymond Carver story and I wrote like a five page essay, just ripping it to shreds. And she was like, I've never had someone react so strongly to Raymond Carver. And it's just <laughs> to this day, like that, I, again, like there, there's a market, like there, there's food that I don't like that other people love. And it's the same thing with Raymond Carver. Like he's just not the author for me. Like I have a lot of philosophical issues with how he tells a story um you know, but yeah so, it's got to be maddening that like a two generations of writers just tried to emulate him you know yeah right? it is like it is very ultimate, maddening quite frankly the ultimate mfa craft <laughs> right you know what i mean everybody tried to 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 you know emulate him so um he's buried like 10 miles from my cabin or something oh cool <laughs> i've never <laughs> gone really to his grave so i'm not a huge fan myself there were some great stories that i did love i i remember i like I just liked them because I recognized some of the, I just recognized some of the gritty working class stuff. Like it, it was refreshing for me as a young guy to read stories that took place in motorhomes. You know what I mean? Cause that's yeah, what yeah. happen, but I can see that. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, yeah. I don't, I definitely don't knock anyone else for enjoying it. Cause again, like there's, there's, there's a taste quality to this and it's just not for me. Um, all right. So next question I have is like, I think as a writer, you always grow with every project that you work on. Like, how did you grow with this particular story? Like this particular novel, small, how does small world change you from, you know, from beginning until finally being done with it? I think as a craftsperson, I, I can answer that two ways. First, as a craftsperson, I think I learned so much about juggling a big cast because I had written another novel 10 years ago, West of Here, which has an equally large cast. And I dealt with it a little differently. I would say pretty adeptly, but it was not as easy to track. I remember, you know, it was it was more of a challenge for the reader to get through. Whereas this one, everyone's like, I'm, I'm flipping the pages. Um, how did it change me personally? It made me feel a little more hopeful about America in a time that I desperately needed that hope. Because, you know, 
uh, six years ago, I was like nine out of 10 people are good people. And then one, one out of 10 is a raging narcissist sociopath. And they're the problem, the 10%. But, you know, the, the, the political climate and geopolitics, all of it's just sort of whittled that down to a 50-50 proposition now, you know, and that's a lot of faith to lose in humanity. And I think that's one of the reasons I wrote this book was to remind myself that, um, you know, when people fight, when we when we reduce ourselves to these sort of uh, uh, these sort of like uh, tribalistic arguments and stuff, I have to remind myself that just like when couples fight, you say things you don't mean. You say things to get an action. I, I really don't think it's as bad as it seems. Do you know what I mean? Like you got these two sides of the aisle just ripping at each other, and 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 I mean, I just thought it couldn't hurt us to sort of let's look at the commonality of this thing and everybody take a few deep breaths. I mean, there's a lot of unforgivable rhetoric out there, believe me. But I mean, I, I just needed something to make it feel not as hopeless because it was a quick turnaround. In like six years, I went from, man, the world is just full of lovely people to like, God, I hate that guy. Put a fucking mask on. You know what I mean? Like, you know, get, you know, uh, you know what I'm saying? So uh, that's what I got out of it. I felt a little more hopeful. I, it felt a little it feels a little more manageable, like possibly we could right the ship or something. No, that's yeah. I think that's wonderful. Um, yeah, I think that's a terrific answer. I think, especially with a book this long, like over this period of time, because it's six years, everything suddenly changed so quickly in this country. Um, you know, it all it had always been there. I think it had been slowly building to that, but then there's a tipping point kind of occurred where it became so much more tribal, just as you mentioned. And yet, in small world, the characters are they all exist in these very unique locations. They all exist in their own separated tribes and of course the train accident can brings them all together in a very unique powerful way and i think that's a great great metaphor for the point you want to make about america and like this the idea of we all need each other to kind of exist and to make things happen yeah and i didn't want to do that with a bunch of exposition that like you know it's always a because i know what my worldview is and politically i know where i stand but i don't i think it's I don't think it helps to really grind that into the the, the text itself you know what i mean i think you got to find ways to sublimate your worldview and find things like the metaphor of the train. Like, look, I can see, you know, things are a little out of control here, but I don't want to go on diatribes. Again, that's subjective, but I don't like to read. I don't want to read the red and the black. I don't even Mm -hmm. Steinbeck, who I love, like some of those mid thirties novels where like you take, uh, you take a story like, uh, you know, the grapes of wrath, which is great because it has the exact same themes of indubious battle. I mean, really they're, 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 they're companions in terms of theme, you know, it's a, but one of them, the whole story is sublimated in this very personal, very human journey of a family. And then the other one reads like a, a socialist screed. And, 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 and one is just so much better than the other. And one is so much more persuasive than the other. I mean, Rosa Sharon breastfeeding that guy at the end is going gonna, is, is gonna to just, you know, that's going to shake you up in a way that no political screed is going to do it. No polemic is going to persuade me the way just humanity will. So like, I do deal with politics in the last, particularly in the last couple of books, but I don't want, I don't want people to be able to say, oh, he's obviously, uh, you know, this side or that side, you know, because that, yeah. that just gets in the way of the story I'm trying to tell. Terrific. Terrific. I completely agree with that. Terrific. Um, so I want to kind of ask a couple of questions that are more aimed at like the, I always say, I always feel there are a few writers, young writers, perspiring writers, however you like to call them um, on, at these kind of events. So like, I would love to hear your thoughts on how writers approach beginning a book because a book is such a massive sprawling kind of terrifying thing to actually start and then i would love to hear about how do you how do you know when a book is done like i would love to hear your thoughts particularly in regard to small world like small world to me is so big like as in writing from a craft standpoint i think reining it in and stopping it at some point would be one of the most difficult things about it so your thoughts on like starting a book for for writers who would kind of get there and then your personal specific thoughts on like how you were able to kind of wrap up when did you know Small World was finished? Okay, that's a great question. I think I can actually do that without getting sidetracked. Is uh, <laughs> I think a funny thing about the starting of the book now is because you know so much of the young writer culture is, you know, so it's about the crap. But simultaneously, they're all like, "I gotta find an agent," kind of thing. You know what I mean? And and so people work the hell out of those first chapters. You know what I mean? It's like the, the impulse is to not move on. And I think that's a mistake because I don't think you really know what you're doing until you get 50 or 60 pages in. I mean, you can outline until you're blue in the face, but I think until you just get out of your own way and give yourself to the thing itself, 
do you really discover the most efficient way to handle things? You know what I mean? And so it's funny because I think I, I understand the urge to like, let's really polish this first chapter. So we know I have a good first step, but the last thing I do when I finish a book, the, every time, I mean, the process is different a little bit every time, but the last thing I do on every book is rewrite the first chapter. Once I know where I'm ending, you go back, you can only just strengthen your own ending by going back. Now I know exactly where I have to end up. So I go back and write that. So I, I think it's really important for these people to just get, just put the words on the page. I know it sounds a little trite, but like, really, you know it, we all know it. When you stack days together, each day kind of gets easier and easier. You give yourself to the story and it just comes mm -hmm. easier and easier, less of you, just getting the self out of the way. As far as the ending goes, you know, they're never really done, but there's going to always <laughs> yeah. be something. But usually what happens is I kind of got an outline of where I want to end. But again, the unconscious, the characters lead me to a place where um, I might think I'm entering my penultimate scene and then I just hit that note. That's how I know it's done. When I hit that note that resonates throughout the whole novel, that note that that walk away. That's the last note I want to sustain. You know, I don't want to fade it out, you know, to put it in musical terms, you got to hit that last note where it's just like, ah, it's still kind of vibrating around in here. And when I hit that, I just know it. And it's never really a set piece. You know what I mean? Sometimes you think you've got this great ending. It's got to be a set piece, but sometimes it's, it's just a moment or like an epiphanic kind of thing, like with Joyce, or it's just, you just find the moment. It's like, you know what? I don't need this other stuff. I've hit it. And I think the thing that makes the ending effective is that to write a great ending, I think it has to be at once surprising, but then just like on a moment's reflection, inevitable. You know what I mean? Like the readers, like maybe I didn't see that coming. It surprises them, but then they're like, yeah, yeah. Now I see how it's all set up. This is, this is, this is the inevitable conclusion. Yeah. I could have got yeah. so sidetracked on this dude. I almost did, you know, in the middle of this <laughs> book, when I finally knew what I was doing, you know, what I, first of all, I cut six characters out completely oh, wow. on each side of the timeline. So it could have been way more unwieldy. And the reason wasn't the characters. The reason was I, they weren't serving the whole as well. It just came down to practical things. Like I can't realistically, you know, I'm stretching the bounds of credulity here, trying to get them on the train. You know what I mean? Where I knew everyone had to be on the train. So it just became logistical hurdles. I love the characters, but they had to go. But then when I, after I, I was in the middle of the book and I knew what I was doing, finally, I had control of the reins. I almost blew it up with a third generation in between. So like everybody, <laughs> another generation of Bergens, another generation of chains, yeah. another generation. And I almost did. And I, I really thought about it long and hard over a six pack in the garage, just really. And I think I made the right choice. I could have really, dude, I could still be working on the thing. You know what I mean? I, <laughs> Do I, no I, you know what? Too much, just too much. Let's just, you know, it's kind of like my kids. I'm baby crazy right now. So is my wife, but we're like, let's just, let's just make sure we do right by the ones we already sorted out. You know what I mean? It would be great to hold another smell, another sweet little baby right now. But like, I got, you know, potentially two weddings to pay for and three <laughs> college education. So I'm like, that's, that's the decision I made was just like, I got to do right by these ones and, and not blow it up. Although part of me still wishes I did just because it's crazy, you know, <laughs> that's, true. Crazy that's wonderful. <laughs> and that's funny because that actually, that actually dovetails nicely to my next question. Like, so that, cause that's, that, statement shows a sense of maturity a sense of growth like you're you know you're a veteran writer at this point so i would love to hear like how has how has jonathan everson changed from writing book one the one that never got like you know from page one book one just young early nascent writer to jonathan everson today january 2022 like i would love to hear about how what changes have you gone through as a creative as a writer like all those if you compare those two people, like who are they as writers and who are they now? Yeah, I think the early books, especially even the early published books, I think had a lot more to do with my voice. You know, I had finally discovered this voice and, you know, whatever it, it, it had a it, it, it had a charming effect on a lot of readers and it was effective storytelling device. But I think as I've gotten older, I've probably become a little less rhapsodic on the page, a little less hyperbolic on the page a little less quirky on the page, a little more controlled. And, and I think the major difference is I just really much more aware of the reader. And when I say the reader, I'm not like the 35 to 60 year old female demographic. You know, I'm just talking about me at the other end and trying to write the story as I want to experience it because it, it, it really opens doors. I mean, once you, once you realize that the reader is the greatest tool you have in your belt, you know, because 
you have all the information and it's all about, I start to view the story a little more purely as information on some level. Like, you know, when bad writing all has one thing in common, you know, I mean, there's a million ways to write bad. You can browbeat people, you know what I mean? You can over yeah. too much exposition or you could go the exact opposite way to obscure. But both of those have the same thing in common. They're forgetting the reader. Yes. You know what I mean? And so like now I'm just, I think that, I mean, it's more of a storytelling thing than a writing. I think a lot of people think about writing. They think about stringing words together. I never, th I don't work my sentences very hard. I don't think about, I don't think about language. And I ha I'm in fact, it's a pet peeve of mine when like, you know, somebody's eating an apple and walking across the parking lot and their thoughts are a smoky chiaroscuro of, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> nostalgia or something. I'm like, come on, they're eating an apple. You know what I mean? Wait till, you know, they're carrying their dead father across the great divide at sunset or something, you know? So the, the words are just like the blood that flows through the story. I want it to swing. You know what I mean? I always think of it in musical terms. I want the, I want them to serve the story. I want them to swing. If I'm writing action, there's probably going to be a pump, 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 pump. You know what I mean? And if I'm, you know, if I am going to get rhapsodic, cause we're talking about love or something like that, it's going to breathe a little more, but like, when I think about writing now, I think really more about telling the story and using the reader as my partner in that to, to because it opens up such wonderful possibilities like, you know, misdirect, which, you know, every mystery writer has to master on some level. But misdirect such a wonderful tool, but you can't use it until you're totally in control of the strings. You know what I mean? And you know what you've given the reader and you know how you can sort of lead or persuade them to think one thing just to pull the carpet out and give them that wonderful surprise. You don't think that way until you just think about the reader, you know? So that's, that's terrific. Thing. Terrific. Um, wonderful. <clears throat> so I see you have another question. Uh, this is actually for me, actually, weirdly enough. Okay, cool. Good. Um, so the question says, did you know going into hell of a book that you want to incorporate humor with the poignancy and the raw themes of race and racism is mixing elements like that humor and seriousness harder or easier from a writing perspective? All right, cool. Um, so for me, uh, writing hell of a book, um, it is it was the humor became a way that I was able to offset the the seriousness and the gravitas of having to write these very heavy, depressing, just kind of soul wrenching sections that I had to write. And I don't say that and I don't describe it that way for like the read. I describe it the way for myself. Like it was a very difficult book for me to write. Um, and kind of as as Jonathan was as you were saying, Jonathan, like. For me, the language has to, it ha it's a story, like it's writing, yes, but it's primarily storytelling that we're actually doing here. So you have to see the person on the other end of the page and tell them this story. And so for me, like there was a, this balance of language, kind of like you said, I want to balance the language to make sure it was, you know, swinging and doing and being active, both in the sadness and in its beauty and bounty and fun and goofiness and weirdness as well. Because um, I, I agree with you in the sense that I agree with you on a lot of things you've been saying tonight. So it makes it sound like it's just this one thing, but like, yeah, like it's cool to have a verbalizing sense. Like we are like writing is storytelling, like writing. Yeah. Writing is writing, but there's a higher plane of like your storytelling. You have to remember that as you go about it, because if you just think of it as writing, you can get lost in the weeds of language and over description and overwriting and spending, you know, 15 pages describing a sunset. It's like, yeah, that's all cool when you're starting out, <laughs> but as you get older, you kind of, you become more, more efficient, more economical, I think. Yeah. And you know, it's funny because to me, when we were, I was talking about endings earlier and I was talking about how the ending needs to be surprising, but inevitable. Mm -hmm. What is that? But a punchline. I mean, that describes why a joke works. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's what the punchline does. It surprises you. You laugh without even wanting to, but you laugh because it's truth and you see it. I mean, I, I can't imagine writing without humor. There's another kind of a literary chestnut dude I know who I've known for a long time. I won't mention his name. I love the guy, but we've had this ongoing debate for like 15 years. He doesn't like to use humor in his stories. And he claims because it's not fair to his characters. And I'm like, well, oh, I mean, to me, to arm any human being without a sense of humor, that's unfair because it's like line one of defense for me. I mean, I, you know, I can't, I mean, comedy and tragedy are so connected in my mind and my heart. Like, I mean, I just, you know, I mean, I would just die of dreariness and I, I would be just too depressing to even, you know, and I wouldn't characterize this as my funniest book, but when I go back and I look at it, I realize that it's still there and, and it needs to be there. There has to be, I can't imagine not, can't imagine writing anything. I mean, about it, you know, people have written about the Holocaust and they've managed to make it funny. You know what I mean? You, you know, I mean, so I don't, you know. 
No, I think that's terrific. Um, so another question here, and this is actually from Andrew Rowe. I actually know Andy. Andy Rowe is a writer, um, and it's actually about writing. It's about publishing. So the question is, uh, Small World was published with Dutton after a long string of novels published with Algonquin. Can you talk about switching publishers? I think it's just kind of a general question about that, um, about s- switching publishers, I think, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was just very lucky to go from um, my Chuck Adams, who I'd done six books with, and he, mm-hmm. he helped start me on this book, I was retiring. So it was kind of a no-brainer for me. I mean, I, I just... When you when you're lucky enough to get published, you work with a whole team of wonderful people and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, your editor is your champion. You know what I mean? That's the person Mm -hmm. who acquired your book, that understands your book, that wants to work with you. And it's really sad when people I mean, I know a lot of writers whose whole careers have been sidetracked because somebody acquires their book and then that person leaves and then. And then the, the person that gets it doesn't really like it that much. They didn't champion it. They didn't buy it. So they're just going through the motions or worse, maybe even trying to co-opt the author's creative uh, vision of it and change it. So it was a seamless transition because Chuck and John Parsley, my editor, are both, uh, they're both executive editors. They're kind of like at the top of the food chain within their respective places. And that made me feel like, okay, my champion's not going to leave me. You know, um, it, it's been a really smooth transition. I've loved where I, I love being with Algonquin for five, six. I think I've worked, you know, a couple of failed books too, but yeah, it's been a really smooth transition. I just feel lucky to be in the game. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just, you know, <laughs> after eight, eight books or seven books and nobody publishing you, it's pretty nice to, you know, have a reader. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? My, before that, my own mom wasn't reading them. So all my friends were kind of more on the jockey end of the spectrum. Not jockey. They're smart guys. But, yeah, like, you know, yeah. it's just... All my friends, I mean, I have so many friends now. I mean, for, for 20 years, I was writing in a vacuum. You know what I mean? I didn't have anybody to, I didn't have any yes. facility to talk about what I even did. It's just what I did. I'd never talked about it. Now I get to meet Jason Mott, the NBA, you know what I mean? And I get to buy him dinner <laughs> eventually. And it's so cool to finally like, it's like finding your tribe in a way to finally connect with other people that do this and understand it because I was just, uh, you know, at first it was almost like a dirty secret. You know what I mean? You risk and getting socked in the shoulder. If you start talking about your poetry or your novel, you know what I mean? It's like, nobody wants to hear about your books. Hey, are you published yet? You know what I mean? So like, <laughs> I do know what you mean. <laughs> I, no, I think that's funny because it's, yeah, I think I think writing and publishing is a very unique world that we, and you know, and once you're once you're kind of over the fence and you're behind the scenes, you see how how unique and strange it actually is. Um, it's a wild ride. Like I would love to hear about like your we were talking you and I were talking earlier about book tours and the chaoticness of like doing a book tour. And obviously, you know, hell of a book. My book is just all about book tours. I would love to like what's your what's your weirdest, wackiest book tour story that you've got? I'm sure you've got a couple. Oh, well, first of all, I'm going to say, listen, I know it can be a grind, but man, it beats the hell out of a man tour. Because in my teens, I was a front man <laughs> for a punk band. And when we toured, that meant five farting guys in an Econo line, you know, like literally sneaking into some teenage kid's window, sleeping on the floor, you know, just eating the worst food, driving through the night. Uh, you know, we got it pretty good. Hundred dollar a day per diem, nice hotel, everything's paid for. But still, it could be it can be a grind because, you know, I really want to just be in my garage, my ivory tower and write the books. I think most of us do. We're not comedians. I knew comedians. They're a horrible species of person. I knew a lot of comedians <laughs> in LA. They are, um, they, they get off on the, like being before the audience, they get energy from it. Right. I have energy while I'm doing it, but I feel drained when I'm done. These people just, it fills them up like a balloon, you know, and it doesn't for me. So it's a hard hat. If you learn and a hell of a book, you know, talks all about book tours and it's, it's, you know, we're lucky to do it. And you have to keep reminding yourself that you're lucky to do it when you're waking up at 530 and it's dark and you, you have a rental car and you have to do the three interchanges to get to the Minneapolis St. Paul airport. And like, you know, and you didn't have time for breakfast and you threw up in the bathroom at the, on the jet, you got to remind yourself how lucky you are. Um, but yeah. <laughs> I forgot what the actual question was. No, oh, that was a great answer. Specific <laughs> stories were just, I mean, I've missed, I've, I've missed flights. I've, you know, I mean, I've, uh, I, one time I, uh, I had to drive from, uh, from um, Durango, Colorado to Telluride in the middle of winter. It was a February release. It was for, uh, it was for West of here. And my GPS took me over Red Pass, which is a notoriously like the most dangerous pass in the country. For whatever reason, I don't know if I had it on scenic, but my uh, my thing took me over Red Pass and it was mid blizzard by the time I got halfway and I'm in like a tourist coupe 
And I, I honestly, I cried. I thought I was going to die, dude. I, I mean, I was like, my hands were like, I had yeah. to, like, when I finally got home, I was like, <laughs> I couldn't even open this <laughs> one. I get to the event and tell her ride, nobody there, not the bookseller. And that's it. And thank God she had a 12 pack of micro brew for me. Cause I'm like, my hand's still like this. I'm like, you just <laughs> put one in there and it's like, <laughs> and I had heard another Algonquin author had taken that pass in the middle of summer and was so upset that she canceled her event and called and like broke down with the publicist. Oh, wow. And like, how can you send me over the pass? I did it in a blizzard in a Taurus with no <laughs> snow tires. I mean, it, I, I really thought I was going to die. That and sounds absolutely there, and terrifying. That's, sounds familiar though, right? Nobody yeah. there. Hey, look at me, New York <laughs> Times bestseller. My buddy lives in the town. I saw him right before I walked in. He goes, oh, I just wanted to say hi. I go, you're not going to come for the event? And he's like, no, I got to go eat dinner. I'm yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like an exercise in humiliation, man. Yeah, we would joke about that. Like you, you're not a true author till no one comes to your events. Like that's your that's your rite of passage. It's get there and it's just you in the chairs, you in the empty chairs. <laughs> it's good. We need that, man. We need so I, I think you need a, a healthy amount of self-contempt and and humility to be good at this. I do. I don't think that uh I just don't think you should entertain it while you're at the, you know, again, like the chain side. I don't think you need to entertain yourself doubt while you're putting your story down. I just think it's going to get in the way. You got to want the ball. You got to drive to the bucket and think you're going to make it, you know? Yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, another question from the audience here is from Paula it says, you both talked about the iconic writers that are not your favorites. Who are the authors that influence your work career and work slash career in general or specifically your latest projects? And are there any books you would have you have or would reread and why so we talked about who we don't like who do you like who influences you and like what do you well, and i want to hear your answer to this so i'm going to turn it around to you make you go first on this one because i'm very okay curious. cool yeah no i have no problem with this like i always it's like when i, I read your book this. i didn't you know i think when you read my book you could probably figure out that i kind of like dickens or steinbecker like i kind of, yeah. kind of feel like you could i i didn't know with you like i was trying to figure out you know i was trying to figure out like i wonder who these guys are or yeah so my my older works like Hell of a book is definitely my old, my, my, the people that I love would not have liked hell of a book if I'm honest about it. And that's part of why I had to write it. That's a whole other discussion. Um, so for me, like my, my favorites are John Gardner and William Golding. Like those are two authors that are my touchstones and have been for my entire, like, ch like not childhood pre-writing career. Like i just love them both as authors, like October light from John Gardner and Grendel from John Gardner. Um, and then um, Lord of the Flies, obviously from William Golden, The Inheritors from William Golden. Like those are the books that I personally like just got in my entire life. And um, yeah, those are like those are my favorites. I reread both. I reread Grendel and I reread Lord of the Flies almost every year. Like usually in winter, I'll reread Grendel and like usually in the spring or summer, I'll reread Lord of the Flies. So those are mine. Yeah, that's cool. So for me, it would be it's like a lineage of writers. I got this kind of wacko theory. I think I got it from my friend Greg Downs originally, which was that like two of the most influential writers in English are Shakespeare and Dickens, you know, and they're so different. The DNA is so different. Shakespeare writes about royalty uh, uh, and, 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 and Dickens writes about the little guy. Uh, uh, Shakespeare writes with characters who are exercising dominion over others often, whereas Dickens characters are being exercised upon by the larger world and all the writers if you go down the list see Faulkner falls squarely in the Shakespearean and I don't love him Cormac McCarthy squarely in the Shakespearean love the work but it just doesn't resonate emotionally with me and then all the guys I love uh, and women all the writers I love just in general come down that path of uh, the Dickens DNA that you know Twain's got the Dickens DNA Steinbeck Frank Norris uh you know, they all have that sort of humanist uh, looking out for the little guy thing going on. Yep. So those are, those are, those would be my big ones, like Twain, Dickens, Steinbeck, Frank Norris, a bunch of terrific, dead terrific. guys. Look at me. I mean, I feel I'm kind of ashamed, but you are what you eat kind of, I guess. That's nothing to be ashamed about. It's awesome. <laughs> all right. We got probably our last question here. We're getting close to the end of time. Our last question comes from Catalyst, looks like. It says, What's your touring preference via YouTube and or the other kinds where your publicists sh uh, schlep sh the, the beer three blocks? So do you like Zoom virtual tours or do you like getting out there and driving across the pass in the snowstorm, all that good stuff? I like Zooms when I'm doing them with you. Uh, and you know, <laughs> I have a great conversation partner. I, I mean... I love, I mean, look, I mean, as much of a gruel, it is, a grueling path it is, I really do miss the, the, I mean, look, I didn't, 
I got to see, I think, 41 states just because of, I think I counted 41 states I went to just for book stuff over the past 15 years. So many places I never would have got to got. So that's more traveling than I've done. I've always been a starving artist before I broke through. And like, so I didn't have a lot of money to travel. I've been to Greece once. I've been, you know, I've been four or five countries, but most of my traveling has come as a result of book touring. So in that respect, but then again, after 15 years, it's nice to have a break from it a little bit now that I have three kids and you know, I, I don't want to be out doing this in a pandemic. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree with that. I hear you. Um, all right, cool. Um, well, I think we're about out of time. I want to, again, thank you so much for letting me be here and talk to you about small world. It is a phenomenal, insanely good book. I really you thank you here. for writing it. Letting you be here. Come on. Thank you for this is so gracious of you to do. I can't wait to see you in Boise buy a great dinner. I really appreciate it. I look forward to talking more too. just picking your brain and talking craft and stuff too. So thank you so much. And anybody who came, thank you. Book passage and I believe did break straw books was also co-sponsoring this. Correct. Michael Barnard, shout out to Michael Barnard. One of my favorite booksellers. I always see him along the road. Awesome cook knows how to pack them in, in that little community of his too, man. There's always like 60 people at his events. Uh, All right, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, and I think, um, from the bookseller perspective and audience perspective, we just, we kind of can't wait to see you guys in person again. Uh, we get the benefits, you know, we get to reach out to so many more people uh, around the world. And who knows if you two could have been together on the road. So we get, we get the benefits of the virtual world, but we certainly do miss that in-person meeting uh, authors like yourself and kind of being able to interact in person with uh, our audience and our customers. But we'll take you however we can get you. <laughs> I will say well, that. Thanks for having us. Yeah, no, no. Thank you both. And Jonathan, uh, you lived up to your background, your green screen, you know, because you set the bar pretty high <laughs> for yourself. Yeah, well, uh, you don't want to see my mom walking around in her slippers behind me. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you guys just one last little, this is what you might have been looking at. <laughs> or this, or this. That's terrific. Or even this. So <laughs> I thought this one was the most apropos. Yeah, love it. Love it. Love you both. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, Jason, for coming on board. Uh, both of you gracing uh, the virtual stage of Rake Straw Books and Book Passage. For our audience, thank you so much for joining us. And by the way, we really had a great showing for a live audience. And it's only going to grow uh, as we're out there on our YouTube channel and people can feel free to kind of share it with their friends and family members. Um, please support books, uh, Book Passage and Rake Straw and other independent bookstores, support Indian Local and get both these authors phenomenal books. Well, turn off your TV and read books. <laughs> yeah, quit binging, enough with the binging. I include myself in that and uh, read some fantastic books. Uh, thank you so much. Until our next event, be safe. Bye. Uh, thanks, everybody.